How do you set up a fair comparison between any two or three or five camera bodies? That's a question that gets complicated fast, but let's see if we can't solve it. So last year I did a shootout comparing five randomly available cameras at how they capture a Milky Way landscape. I matched all the settings across each camera and tried my best to snap the exact same target at nearly the same time. But, as I lamented in that video, while accounting for all the factors I could, I did not have one lens that would work with every single camera body tested. And as we learned from the results, that can lead to some very big differences. Some of the lenses I was forced to use simply couldn't match settings, and in many cases two lenses having the same aperture and focal length does not translate into an exact one-to-one -one comparison. The solution is obvious. If we were ever going to do this again, we'd need one very versatile lens, and a few adapters. Enter the Rokinon 14mm f2.8 wide-angle lens, the finest astrophotography lens money can- no, 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 it's not that. But actually, this is a pretty great lens. Short of a full lens review, this is a lightweight, full-frame lens with very satisfactory optical quality with an extremely affordable price point. I got this one used and in great condition from Adorama. This is not my first Rokinon lens. In fact, the lens that I have by far used the most for night shots is this 12mm Rokinon that I got from my Sony APS-C camera. Neither of these lenses has any kind of electronic control. It's all manual, which is actually totally fine for astrophotography because you're always going to dial things in yourself anyway. At these wide focal lengths and apertures, you simply cannot beat the price and portability of Rokinon lenses. For high-end quality, there are definitely other options, but expect to pay double for even the next best thing. As one additional note about lens choice, I bought this one in the Canon EF format, and there's a very good reason for that. While the majority of cameras I use professionally are mirrorless cameras, mirrorless lenses are literally impossible to adapt across product lines. You literally cannot fit one inside the receiver of another at a distance that will actually focus light on the sensor. Canon DSLR lenses are still the absolute most easily adapted lenses on the market, so if you're thinking about using one lens across multiple platforms, take this information into consideration. Now let's jump right into this year's lineup. We have the Canon EOS T3i, EOS 6D, and EOS R6, and the Sony A6500 and A7R5. Not that different from last year's lineup and very similar to what I just used for my Eagle Nebula shootout. As I mentioned before, the A7R5 is a notable addition as the current flagship of the A7 line. It is not considered the king of low light, as that title is claimed by the S model, but it does feature more than double the megapixels of any other camera in this comparison, and I'm sure that will come into play as we look at the results. Before anyone mentions it, this marks my third comparison without a Nikon or Pentax contender. This isn't for a lack of interest, so if any of you has one they'd like to send me, hit me up. Joking aside, I am on the lookout for a photographer friend willing to lend one, but I won't turn away any generous strangers in the meantime. I mean, if you have an A7S III that you're just tired of hanging on to, feel free to send it my way. I'm dying to see for myself if it lives up to all the hype. With all of that out of the way, let's show the results. These are raw and unedited, so you're sure to notice some unique streaks and other idiosyncrasies. Just as before, every image was captured with a 20 second exposure at an ISO value of 6400 and a white balance set to 5200K. Like last year, I want you to take a second to decide which one you think looks best at this distance, then we'll zoom in for deeper comparisons. You'll notice that two of these images are cropped in, and that's completely to be expected when we compare APS-C cameras, one from Canon and one from Sony, to the full frame cameras that this lens was meant for. Let's take a look at this first one. You've probably already guessed by the noise and lack of light capture that this is the T3i. You've heard me say it before and I'll say it again, it's old and that shows, but it's not a terrible starter camera even today. That said, if you can afford the bump up to a Sony mirrorless APS-C like the A6500, I say absolutely do it. Much better light capture and far less noise. Now comparing scene for scene with the 6D really isn't fair here, so we'll just move on to the R6. Once again, the 6D outperforms the newer model. You might think this light on the horizon from a car so distant I couldn't even see it with my physical eyes is skewing our perception, but when you take a close look at the corners or at the image's core, it's irrefutably true that the 6D simply does capture more light than the R6. Somewhat unexpectedly, so does the A6500. Don't get me wrong, there are reasons to choose the R6 over the smaller mirrorless from Sony, noise to a small degree being one of them. But for detail, you're not really missing out with the A6500 if you can compensate for the crop. I think you can even argue that it produces less noise than the 6D. Alright, time for the big one. 
Comparing these two full-frame mirrorless images side by side leads to one very obvious winner. More pixels can sometimes be a problem with capturing dark scenes, but that is clearly not the case for the A7R5. It's not just more light, it's a lot more light, especially in the shaded areas. And when you zoom in, the difference the pixel count makes becomes staggering. It's well worth noting that these cameras do not come in at the same price point, but the EOS R6 is reported to have higher low light sensitivity than the EOS R5 while using the very same image processor, making it on paper the preferred choice for this comparison. In last year's Milky Way shootout video, I tried to avoid making any sweeping declarations because of all the variables introduced by the various lenses I had to use, but we have effectively neutralized those concerns in this year's shootout. So now you have to make the case for whether or not to buy each of these models. I keep including the T3i because they're easy to come by. You probably know someone who has a camera from the Rebel series just lying around. If all you want is to give night shots a try, I'd say grab it and go. If you did have some cash though, you wouldn't be wasting it on a used Sony mirrorless APS-C like the A6500. As for full frame, the 6D keeps punching well above its age, but it simply cannot contend with these newer mirrorless models from the Sony Alpha 7 line. So if you already have a 6D, you've got a decent option for night shots, but you might consider renting something newer just to see if you like how far the tech has come. As for the EOS R6, I'm comfortable saying now that I wouldn't recommend it to someone strictly looking to get into astrophotography. It's a great camera for a lot of things, and we use it at work all the time. But these comparisons keep demonstrating why Sony has a reputation for low light. It would be cool to someday compare each variant in the 7 line, but I have been thoroughly impressed with the light capture and deep detail reliably coming out of the A7R5. Perhaps not the best astrophotography camera on the market, but certainly the best I have tested so far. Brightest images aside, which of these photos surprised you the most? Let me know in the comments. It's pretty obvious at this point that I'm likely to do more comparisons like this in the future, so keep the suggestions coming. Thanks to you guys, I'm now on the lookout for a good Pentax model to borrow and test. Until then, feel free to look at what I've been shooting over on my Instagram page. Thanks for checking out this video, and I'll see you on the next one.